so I'm uh, going to talk a bit about blockchain. Uh, and in this talk, I will assume that you know uh, what a blockchain is. So if you don't, you should have been on the previous talk. So, <laughs> so um, currently, uh, I'm working for a company called Eternity. And we're building a new blockchain um, with uh, the goal of uh, being sort of generation three of blockchain. So we, we had bitcoins first that paved the way. And then Ethereum came along with smart contracts and a lot of uh, new interesting features. And the goal now is to uh, come up with uh, the next generation of, of blockchain after Ethereum, basically. Um, so by taking the the good bits from, from the first generations of blockchain and, and building something new that is efficient and where we want to give transparent governance and global scalability. And we're, of course, using Erlang. And I'm not going to talk that much about why we're using Erlang so for this. Uh, Ulf Wieger gave a talk in London two weeks ago, and I think if you Google it, you can probably find it, or uh, Francesco has it on some server, probably. Eternity YouTube, Eternity YouTube channel, you can find it on, uh, where he gives a whole talk about why using Erlang for uh, building a blockchain. Uh, but uh, of course, it's very nice to ha have something that's robust, scalable, and where you can do operation and maintenance. We're also using Elixir. So we have one Erlang team, and then we have an Elixir team that are doing even more rapid uh, prototyping, and they're testing different techniques in Elixir uh, uh, and using uh, the Erlang stuff that we're building in the core team. Uh, to, to try new ideas and building uh, a lot of higher level uh, stuff on top of the blockchain. And then we have a front end team that's using JavaScript and uh, so on and, and building applications on top of all this. Currently, we have a, a somewhat seasoned Erlang team. So uh, uh, I calculated a couple of weeks ago that we have more than 150 years of Erlang experience in less than 10 people that uh, are in the team. So I've been doing Erlang since 94, but uh, Ulf Wieger has been doing it even longer than that. And then we have Thomas Arts and uh, John Hughes and Tobias, who wrote Dialyzer originally, uh, and some other people. And we also added three more people uh, the last week to the team, probably not with 25 years of experience, but uh, between 10 and three years Erlang experience. So we have some experience. So why? Uh, uh, do we have eternity, and what, what do we want to do that is new uh, with this blockchain? So one, uh, the, the sort of main point uh, from a, a slightly technical point of view is that we are providing a number of things that when Ethereum came out and people started writing smart contracts on Ethereum, uh, they started to implement a number of things uh, several times, things that uh, a lot of people wanted. And that's oracles, names, tokens, governance, state channels, and contracts. Maybe not governance so much. And contracts, of course, is the underlying technology for this. So what uh, Eternity will provide is to actually have these types of objects as first class objects on the chain. And I will come back to what that means. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what each of these types are. So we have oracles. 
And the goal with an oracle is to bring in outside information into this chain. And this data is structured, so you can, and it has type, so you can say that this oracle will always answer true or false, or this oracle will give you an integer, or this oracle will give you a floating point value, or whatever it's going to give you. Uh, it could, of course, also give you a text string with um, whatever, and it can give you maps with um, key value pairs and so on. So the, the important part is that it's structured and it's a first class object that we can refer to. Uh, yes, and we can talk a lot about oracles. They are not really representing the real world. It's someone is presenting uh, information to the chain and you somehow have to decide whether you trust it or not. But uh, if you decide to trust it, you can use this in your contracts. That's what we're coming up to. We also have names as first class objects. So um, uh, that means that you can give a human readable name to an address on the blockchain. So instead of just having the hash or the uh, public key, you, you will have a, uh, an, an real uh, readable address. So working a little bit like uh, a domain name server. And you can give any first class object on the chain a name, like an oracle or a, an account or a contract and so on. And then we have tokens. So tokens can be used to represent something in the real world and something with, with value in the real world or just uh, a new uh, cryptocurrency. So you can create a new type of token and then you can have when you do that, you set up the rules for that token, whether there will be a finite amount of those tokens or whether you can create new tokens and whether there are unique tokens or, or just uh, accounts with tokens and so on. And you can exchange between different types of token with atomic swaps and so on. And all this is first class transactions on the chain. Uh, then we're also implementing governance. Uh, so you can uh, make a proposal as a transaction on the chain and then have a voting period where people can vote on this uh, suggestion and then um, this, this will lead to a, a result and then it will depend a little bit what will happen. So in some cases it might be that, uh, for example, the the Coinbase, uh, the, the reward that you get for mining a block is increased or decreased if uh, a vote goes through and that will happen directly from a certain block height. Uh, but the important thing here is that you actually have a first class object on the chain, a transaction on the chain for voting basically. And then we also have state channels and uh, State channels uh, is a way to reduce uh, the number of transactions on the chain. So uh, you can uh, do many, many transactions by us doing two transactions on the chain. So you have one transaction that says open a state channel and you do be this between two parties. And uh, at that time you, each party will uh, set an amount of tokens into the channel and then at the end uh, one of the parties will post a close channel and then he will say how these funds will be distributed between the two participants. And the thing is that all the transactions uh, between the parties can be done off chain and both parties sign each transaction and uh, they are numbered, so you can always post the latest transaction back to the chain and close the channel in a state where you both have agreed to it. And if someone tries to post a previous state, uh, then uh, you will just post the latest state and prove that actually we agree that this is the way things are now. 
So there's uh, many interesting things you can do with this. You can build an application, for example, uh, like Netflix, where you stream uh, video, but you pay for each frame. So for every frame, you actually sign that you've gotten the frame and that you paid for the frame. And you can do this very, very fast, very, very micro transaction. So you start the, the, the contract with um, uh, the price for the whole movie. And if you're not receiving the whole movie, you will post uh, the, only the transaction that said, well, I got this far, and so I'm only going to pay uh, 25 cents for, for this because I didn't get the whole movie. So you can only lose a little bit of money for each uh, step in the process. But this you cannot do on an ordinary blockchain because you have 10-minute uh, cycle times or at least 30-second cycle times to get transactions through a block. And um, uh, it would cost a lot also to do all these transactions. But with state channels, you can have lots and lots of transactions. Or you can have um, slower transactions, like you uh, with your coffee house. You don't want to, every time you buy a coffee there, you don't want to charge something through the blockchain. So you open an account with your coffee house, and every time you buy a coffee, uh, you transfer something through the state channel. So this is the, the main approach from Eternity to uh, increase the scalability and, and reduce the, the computational need uh, and be able to handle a lot more transactions. But there are also first-class objects on the chain. And then we have uh, what's called smart contracts. And uh, as some people have said, they are neither smart nor contracts. But they are really just uh, code that can be executed and verified by the miners on the chain. So, uh, and the code that is executing can affect the state uh, of the chain. So it's a controlled way of uh, of running uh, code. And this is uh, sort of the, the goal of this talk, to talk about these contracts. So we uh, set out with um, four goals when we started to creating the way that we wanted to handle contracts. So it should be safe, uh, it should be efficient and scale, uh, it should be cheap to run contracts, and there should be an easy migration path from Ethereum contracts to Eternity contracts. So the first goal, that contract execution should be safe. Uh, so with this, we mean that you can specify properties and you can prove that these properties holds for a contract. And in order to do this, we designed a new language called Sophia. I We'll talk a little bit more about that in a uh, while. Uh, with the goal to actually have a language that is rich enough so that you can um, say pretty much anything you, you want, but still a, a bit constrained, it's typed, and, and that where you can have properties that you can actually prove about this uh, contract. And then we, when we compile it, we keep the types and all the way down to a new virtual machine, the for the win virtual machine, FTWVM, which actually check things uh, while it runs, uh, uh, very much like uh, the Erlang runtime system. I'll talk more about that soon. And the second goal was um, that contract execution should be efficient and scale. So, uh, the, the best way to scale thing is through the, the state channels, really. So uh, that's uh, one way that we're trying to scale, and, and we're investigating new proofs of work and consensus algorithm to come up with uh, a way that we can make a, a scalable chain. Uh, currently, we're lo looking mostly at uh, Bitcoin NG, which is a uh, the next uh, generation Bitcoin, but it's a next generation also in the sense that 
you first claim a block and then the winner gets to produce all the, the coming blocks for a while without doing any proof of work. So the most of the scalability things on the blockchain will go into those parts and not so much into the contract languages. Uh, I seriously don't think that execution time of a contract uh, done right will, will have very much impact on the, on the mining time. But uh, also to, to make this uh, a very efficient way to execute contract, we devised a new language called uh, currently just, um, oh, uh, it actually has a name, Varna, we can get back to that. Uh, but a new virtual machine that we only call the high level virtual machine, which is not really a virtual machine. It's sort of built into the mining nodes. So when they verify uh, transactions on the blockchain, one thing that they verify also are, are these uh, contract more or less straight off in the code that, that is written to, to verify um, contracts or verify uh, transactions. Oh. And uh, our third goal was that contract execution should be cheap. And this is not really in our control. It will be the miners and the users that decide the price. Uh, but we have this high level contract language at which we can have a flat rate for uh, execution, which we think will keep prices down. And then we wanted to be able to port Ethereum contracts to the uh, Eternity. And uh, therefore, we also have a, our own version of the Ethereum virtual machine, EVM. So to recap the goals, we had safe, efficient, cheap, and easy migration. And of course, these contract, these goals don't really mix. Uh, so we're not going to try to combine them. So as I said, we have several different solutions. So and by having a version of the Ethereum virtual machine, we can actually take Solidity and EVM contracts and run them uh, directly in Eternity. And this also makes it possible for us to get a lot of examples to, to try out and see how it works on our chain. Uh, and we have some enhancements of the EVM. Instead of having self-destruct, um, uh, we have a garbage collected self-destruct. So uh, every time you refer to another contract, there's a reference counter that is increased. And if you try to kill your contract, uh, it will not die until all, new, all references to that contract also has died. So uh, that will uh, st stop some of the problems that uh, you see in the people using libraries or other contracts. And then those contracts are killed. And then the, the contract that you had becomes meaningless. So this will not be able to happen at the cost of possibly keeping contracts a little bit, bit longer. We're using a different hashing algorithm and different curve. Uh, we introduce subroutines, which will come to the EVM also in the future and some more stack manipulation to handle a functional language and some things we need for this. So our first language is Sophia, uh, after a city. And uh, it's a typed functional programming language. It's a dialect of ML or Camel or actually uh, Reason, which is a Facebook variant of uh, OCaml. And it can be compiled to this uh, for the Win virtual machine, FDWEM. And it will have a way to define properties. And they can be proven to hold or disproven, resulting in compiler error. And then you cannot get a contract. So this is an example of what Sophia code will look like. So this is a, a simple contract where you can store an integer in this contract and then you can uh, set the value of the integer and get the value of the integer. Uh, so it's um, uh, uh, typed and functional. 
And the whole compiler is typed, and it keeps track of all the types all the way uh, down to the machine code. And the machine, it's um, functional, uh, and it's typed, and it's uh, warded, uh, uh, which actually means would be called checked in most cases. So it will check that there's no overflows or divide by zero and so on. But to get the nice name, FTW, it's warded. So now we have a new word for check that we can use. Uh, and then we have the high level language Varna, uh, which is similar to the Bitcoin script language, but uh, uh, it has no loops and you can have a flat guess uh, price for it. But now we're getting back to this thing that we have all these nice things that you want to talk about as first class objects. So with your, your cafe example, um, the idea would be that the same channel would be, will be reused? Yes, so, that, so, so you can actually uh, every now and then do a, a sort of keep this open but distribute money according to the current state as it is now and insert new money. So uh, once a year or every day or every month, cafe only can take out some money and use it in some new money. So there's uh, Are there timeouts associated with that, that channel that you can apply, or it would just stay open until it would just stay open until someone closes it. Um, how would you avoid collusion with governance when there are malicious actors who collude together for voting? So the the voting will uh, be based on uh, uh, tokens. That, so it will be proof of stake for the voting, and it will cost a little bit to to raise a a vote total. So essentially, uh, higher value entry to become participants or very limited intent. Uh, what's the incentive for miners or for 
people to have logs? Is, is, is this thing as a provisioning blockchain or would you provide incentives to mine the new logs? And if so, would that involve a currency, a cryptocurrency? Yes, so there is already a currency, so it's uh, uh, up and faded already. So that's the currency that's going to uh, be rewarded to miners. I'm going to think that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much, Eric.